Today our topic is renal masses, what to do inpatient uh, versus outpatient. I have the honor of introducing us to William Parker, who is the assistant professor and uh, director at the Department of Surgical Urology out at KU. Uh, and he comes to us from the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, he completed a general surgical internship and urology residency out at KU and uh, then went on to do a fellowship uh, out at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And then uh, missed us so much that he came back to KU to get back into the Midwest. So without further ado, I'd like to give a, a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Parker. So I'm Will Parker. Um, I did go north for a little while um, before I came down uh, back to KU. The only thing that will pick up for me from the, my time uh, in Georgia is I will occasionally say y'all. Uh, so just be prepared for that, but otherwise I don't really harbor a strong southern drawl as we were talking about earlier. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is renal masses, kind of what to do inpatient, outpatient, and then just some general updates in renal cell carcinoma and kind of how I think about RCC and maybe um, how you can apply it when you see people um, with renal masses. So I have no disclosures. Um, in terms of things, you know, incidental renal masses is a very common problem. So if you look at axial imaging, um, most studies would show somewhere around, you know, 10 to 15 percent rate of incidental renal masses across the board when you get an axial image for some reason. Abdominal pain, cholelithiasis, what be it. Um, these are very common findings and so it's a common problem when you see a patient, what do you do with it? How should you think about it? How anxiety provoking is it? Um, the reality is, is that the incidence of renal cell carcinoma on the other hand is very low. So if you look across the population, it's only about 1.2 in 10,000 person years. So a lot of imaging is done, but not a lot of people out there in the world actually have renal cell carcinoma. Uh, the first real branch point when you see these people in you know, this is an extremely anxiety provoking thing when you tell somebody they have something on their kidney or any part of their body is, is this solid or is it cystic? And that's because what you do and how you think about it depends a lot on that. So just some, you know, imaging here, obviously, this is the cystic mass. Um, I apologize, I've had a lot of coffee today. That's why this is bouncing all around. On the other hand, um, you know, solid mass, much more concerning. Um, and enhancing as we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. So in terms of cystic masses, the way that we think about this is with something called the Bosniak scoring system. So it's a scoring system that the radiologist came up with to look at, at cysts and really give some sense of what the chances this could represent a malignancy of some form. Um, a Bosniak 1 cyst is kind of your common cyst. About 15% of the population will have cysts in their kidney. Um, these are thin walled. I liken it to a water balloon. It really is nothing. Um, the thought behind this is that at some point in time, the kidney, which is just a big old filter, um, has one of these tubules that gets plugged up, get a back pressure, slowly dilates, and lo and behold, you have truly a water balloon, or in this case, a urine balloon, um, seeing the kidney. Uh, Bosniak 1 cyst is simple. There are no septations, which is like walls in a house. There's no calcification. There's no enhancement. Um, these are things that don't need to be followed. They don't require anything whatsoever. Um, they tend not to cause pain or symptoms unless they are absolutely gigantic. Bosniak 2 cysts, similarly, there's almost no chance that this is a malignancy. The only difference is, is that these can start to have some walls in the, um, in the house. Again, my coffee showing up, um, or even small calcifications. Um, these don't need to be followed. It's when you start to get more complexity that you start to think, could this actually be a cancer? Um, a Bosniak 2F is this kind of intermediary uh, classification for, for renal cysts. That should be followed. The F actually means follow. Uh, the chance that this is a malignancy is around 10%, um, and so most would recommend having it rechecked in about 10 months to, or excuse me, six months to monitor follow-up. 
Posnick 3, now you're really thinking this is a cancer, it's about a 50-50 shot. Um, it will have some enhancement or solid components to it. These are ones that really should be evaluated and seen. The nice thing is, is that for cystic renal masses, these tend to be cystic renal cell carcinoma. Cystic renal cell carcinoma is about as benign a behaving cancer as you can get. They don't tend to metastasize or spread. And the size, when you think about size of masses, doesn't really you know, equate to anything because so much of the mass is a cyst that not a lot of it is actually cancer. Um, so from a reassurance standpoint, when you see these, I tell people really, you know, this is something that no matter how we treat it, it's largely going to be cured. Bosniak 4, this is cancer. So 100% chance that this is cancer, there's really no question about it. And the thing is, is that these are almost entirely enhancing and are filled with, with solid components. The reality is this probably isn't a cyst, this is more likely a renal cell carcinoma that at some point in time developed a cystic component to it. Um, in terms of this going into the Bosnia, I, I don't really grade these out that commonly. I rely on my radiologists a lot to help me, um, particularly in these lower, you know, Bosnia 2, 2F, 3 ranges, um, just to kind of look at it. And so I would encourage you, whenever you see a cyst, you know, call your radiologist and say, what do you think about this? You know, could you grade it? Could you give a Bosnia score to it? Solid masses, on the other hand, this is where we really think cancer. So 80% of the time a solid renal mass, if you look across the board, is going to be renal cell carcinoma or kidney cancer. Uh, the remainder are going to be benign lesions. So angiomyolipomas, that's about 10% of the time. That's a benign tumor made up of fat, blood vessels, and muscle. Um, oncocytomas, which is really just a benign ball of, of cells, essentially in the kidney, for lack of a better expression. And then there are other truly benign lesions in the kidney, but 80% of the time this is going to be a kidney cancer. And it can be associated with familial syndromes as we've all learned about, von Hippel-Lindau, tubular sclerosis, berthog um a lot of syndromes out there associated with the renal cell. <clears throat> in terms of angiomyolipomas, the hallmark here is fat. So anything with fat in it on a scan is an angiomyolipoma, doesn't matter what else it looks like. Uh, the way to, to know this is you put a cursor over it on your imaging software and see what's the Hounsfield unit of the mass and if it has any negative number in it anywhere, it's an AML. Um, and you know, obviously you can look and see dark is fat, dark is fat, these are AMLs. Um, and so these are things that are not cancer, but they're not without some form of risk. So as they get bigger, because it's a formation of blood vessels and these aren't normal blood vessels, they can bleed. Uh, really what we look at is a cutoff of about four centimeters where the bleeding risk begins to climb. It's not a huge bleeding risk, but unfortunately when they do bleed it's quite dramatic and it can be something that, that in truth can be life-threatening. Um, so anything that's over four centimeters certainly should be followed. Pregnancy also, so younger women, even if they have very small AMLs, these are ones that raise a lot of concern because they can spontaneously bleed because of the progesterone that comes out during pregnancy. Uh, there are some treatments that we can do beyond surgery. Uh, a lot of emphasis now on systemic therapies like we use for renal cell carcinoma have evidence of work in, um, two, or in uh, AML and right now they're approved for people with tubular sclerosis which is associated with AML uh, but there are currently clinical trials going on for spontaneous, dark to me sporadic. Uh, and all of these should be followed in some way, shape or form. So what about the workup? So again, you know, the real point here is, is what should you do when you see one of these patients? How should you follow them? So, you know, again, real mass. If you look at the guidelines, the guidelines are very useful in this setting. So these are the NCCN guidelines. Um, you know, certainly everybody should be evaluated. HMP. Um, you want to look at lab, CBC, comprehensive metabolic profile. The reason for that is that renal cell does have perineoplastic syndromes associated with it. Um, you know, erythrocytosis, thrombocytosis, they can have things. The reason to get a CMP isn't just to look at their kidney function, but you also want to look at their liver function. Uh, that's for a couple reasons. So kidney cancer can metastasize to the liver. That can be an early sign. The other is, is there's this really weird perineoplastic syndrome with kidney cancer called Stauffer syndrome, which is where you get a fulminant hepatitis associated with their, their renal cell carcinoma that has nothing to do with metastatic disease that goes away once you treat their, their mass, but it's important to know about. 
In terms of other imaging, so everybody should get some chest imaging, uh, but some people should get other things. So bone scans are important if anybody has bone pain or if they have high volume disease, um, if they have el elevated alkaline phosphatase, should be considered working up for a bone metastasis. On the flip side, if they come in with mental status changes, confusion, headaches, or if they have kind of an odd pattern of spread. So most renal cell carcinoma, if it spreads, goes to the lungs. But let's say they've got some weird disease in their liver or in some odd bony sites. You know, that's where I start to think this could potentially have a metastatic lesion in the brain. The reason that it's important to do this uh, and to work up particularly with brain MRI in patients who have renal cell carcinoma where you're worried about it is that Renal cell carcinoma is an angiogenic cancer. So all the treatments, and we'll talk about some systemic treatments in a little bit, but all the treatments are aimed at the angiogenic cascade. So these things grow a lot of blood vessels, which means they like to bleed. And unfortunately, when there's a bleed in the brain, that's catastrophic. And all the treatments that we do for kidney cancer tend to involve surgery. And when we put people to sleep and they undergo the hemodynamic changes associated with induction of anesthesia, if they have a brain metastasis, there's a very high risk of bleeding. Um, so these need to be found, uncovered, and evaluated. And then the other thing to, to worry about, obviously the kidney's made of two parts. So there's the filter, which is the kidney, and then there's the collecting system, which is the plumbing. Um, and you can get you know, renal cell carcinoma in the collecting system of the kidney, or excuse me, uh, urothelial carcinoma in the collecting system of the kidney, uh, which is gonna be hallmarked by hematuria and an infiltrative mass. So Urothelial carcinoma in the kidney doesn't look like kidney cancer, so it doesn't look like a nice neat ball. Essentially, the kidney will have a normal shape to it, but it's just not gonna look normal. It's gonna look like it's infiltrated with something else. As far as the workup, so what about an inpatient? Um, you know, we do see these uh, come in where they get admitted, again, for something else, and lo and behold, they have a kidney mass. So this is a classic scenario. So a 60-year-old guy who had flank pain and confusion um, examination had a palpable mass. You know, the old teaching was was that kidney cells or kidney cancer had a classic triad, right? Flank pain, hematuria, and a palpable mass. And we don't really see that anymore because everybody gets scans for you know a boatload of reasons unrelated to their kidneys. But this guy is truly that scenario. So palpable mass, flank pain, confusion, and his CT showed what is obviously a completely you know replaced kidney with what is very obviously a kidney cancer. He also had you know, liver metastases, which isn't showing up on, on that imaging. Um, but what should you do next? So again, I go back to the guidelines, and really the next steps are complete the evaluation, get the scans. As I mentioned, this is somebody who had high volume metastatic disease, so you're worried about you know, bone mets, and you're worried about brain metastases. And what we found was that he had some obstructive jaundice, mainly because the mass was so big, um, but he also had pulmonary metastatic disease and bony mets. Well, what now? So you've got this guy who's got just advanced disease. He has cancer in a lot of spots. Uh, and really, the inpatient management of these patients should be uh, to ensure that appropriate staging is or obtained, which goes back to the guidelines. And really, the role for a urologic evaluation or a surgical workup is kind of four real scenarios. So an unreliable patient, if you're worried they're never going to come back to clinic and they've got one of these big masses, obviously they should get plugged in some way, somehow, and that's a good you know, time to do it while they're under your watch. Um, somebody who has uncontrolled pain, so if you just can't palliate their symptoms, you know, we'll do nephrectomies for big masses like that in an urgent situation if we can't get their pain under control. If they have uncontrolled hematuria or symptoms, so you know the risk there is that they could develop so much blood in the urine that they go into retention because they're just developing so many clots and things, and you know that's a, a reason to get an evaluation more urgently. And then a high-level tumor thrombus. So what about tumor thrombi? So you know kidney cancer is very unique in how it can do things. So I, I alluded to the fact that this is an angiogenic cancer. And because of that, one of the things that kidney cancer can do is it can spread contiguously through the renal vein and into the inferior vena cava. And it's very shocking when you see it. You know, obviously, every, you know, every time you see it for the first time, you think, oh my goodness, this is an emergency. There's a thrombus. This thing could break off at any minute. It could embolize, you know, doomsday scenarios and things. And the way we look at them is how high does it go? So, you know, if it's below the level of the liver, it's either a level one or a level two thrombus. These are actually really safe. So, you know, they need to be treated. 
they need to be treated with some urgency. Uh, but the reality is, is that this is a cancer that has spread contiguously. It's not suddenly going to break off, it's not suddenly going to embolize, and it's not suddenly going to cause some catastrophic event. And so these truly are urgencies, but not emergencies. Uh, I would say that typically they need to be treated within the next couple of weeks, but not within the next day. Really where the urgency comes in to do things in an uh, inpatient evaluation and setting is with level 3 and level 4 thrombi. These are masses that go beyond the liver into the chest um, and into the heart. And so, you know, the, the issue there is, is that with a high level thrombus, there's a lot of workup that needs to be done. So these are masses that when we treat them, we have to put people on bypass, we have to stop the heart, we tend to, you know, do full arrest and so you know they need an evaluation by a cardiothoracic surgeon they need to know if they need to have a you know artery bypass grafting at the same time because we're going to be looking at their heart um, so there's a lot that needs to happen in a very short period of time to get these people to the operating room the other issue is is hemodynamic instability so it's very rare uh, to actually have somebody have a problem with their tumor thrombus so thrombi can come in all different shapes and forms. You can have big massive tumor thrombi that occlude everything in the inferior vena cava and people will come in off the street saying I feel fine. And you look at it and you go, why is that? And the reason is, is that this is a very slow and chronic process. By the time they obstruct their vena cava, they've collateralized their entire venous return. And so it's not like they have, you know, hemodynamic collapse because of that. Uh, it's just such an insidious process. And then, you know, in terms of the evaluation of this, these patients all need MRIs, so you know everything that I've shown to this point has been CT-based because everybody gets CT scans. This is the one case where in the absence of renal failure or renal dysfunction, an MRI needs to be obtained, and that's because this is really the only modality that has any good reliability to look at the inferior vena cava and the hepatic veins and the liver and the association of kind of all the complex vasculature that goes in um, to dealing with these particular thrombi in cases. And then there really is no role for a anticoagulation. So that's a common question that comes up. Do I need to put this person on Coumadin or Lovenox or something? And the only role for that is if they have occlusive bland thrombus below the level of the, the tumor thrombus. And so the thing to know about that is when you look at scans, tumor thrombi go up, so they go towards the head. Nothing goes down towards the feet. And so if you see thrombus below the level of the renal vein, that is bland thrombus. And so that's the kind of stuff that actually will embolize off and cause PEs and DVTs. So those need to be anticoagulated. And then anybody who just comes in and has a PE or a DVT and instantly you find the tumor thrombus, obviously they need anticoagulation as well. So that's inpatient. Uh, you know, pretty straightforward, really getting imaging, getting the appropriate workup, and then making sure they're plugged in appropriately. As far as outpatient, so another case, it's an 85-year-old guy, he had an ultrasound to look for his renal function, um, his baseline creatinine was found to be 1.55, that's while he was being watched for his CLL, <clears throat> that was chronic, and mass in the kidney, and so the next step, as per the guidelines, Axial imaging is the most important next step in this evaluation. So really a CT scan or an MRI. You know, CT scans with contrast, you can really push contrast to a great degree with patients with creatinines even up to about two. You know, obviously you want to look at their GFR. It's not as straightforward as just creatinine. Um, but you can give them contrast. Just understand there may be a little bump in their creatinine. But for patients with uh, you know, renal insufficiency where you're worried about the contrast, you can give them gadolinium and do an MRI. Um, the thing to know there is is that there is this rare gadolinium contrast or a contraindication that comes in with uh, renal dysfunction called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, which is just a devastating thing when it happens. Um, you know, essentially it's a skin fibrosis and sclerosis and they, they are debilitated when this happens. Um, so just watch the renal function as you do this. This guy Grand 1.55, I gave him contrast, and lo and behold, that mass was here kind of sitting smack dab in the middle of the kidney. And so, kind of in terms of switching gears, when you have the solid mass, you know, what do you do now? Obviously, you still get all the things that you need to get per the guidelines. But how do you think about these kidney masses when you see them? You know, I said coming through the door that 80% of the time this is going to be a kidney cancer. The moment people hear the word cancer, they stop listening to every other word that you say, um, and 
they're not going to hear anything other than if they have somebody in the room who can repeat it back to them later on down the road. So how should you think about this when you see somebody and you're telling them almost certainly they have cancer? So first off, size matters. So pun intended, this is a urology talk, but size does matter. And so the smaller the mass, the less likely this is going to be a kidney cancer. So mass is less than one centimeter in size, which is what you most often will find on incidental masses. It's only a 50-50 shot, so it's not 100% not that they have cancer. But the moment you start getting above a centimeter, that risk is truly in that 80% range. And by the time you're at masses that are five centimeters in size, you're close to 90% uh, probability that they have kidney cancer. So 80%, that's just a number to kind of lock away, but 80% of all are going to be malignant, and that risk goes up with size. So what is renal cell carcinoma? You know, it's a spectrum of diseases. So all of these come from some cell within the, the kidney itself. Most commonly, it's going to be a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. That's about 80% of the time. You're probably noticing a theme here. There's a lot of 80% here. It's true, about 80% of the time it's clear cell, about 80% of the time solid masses are kidney cancer. Uh, but there are other things that you can get. So there are going to be papillary renal cell carcinomas, there are going to be chromophobes, cystic renal cell, translocation renal cell carcinomas, medullary collecting duct, a ton of different things um, that you can see. And obviously, you know, those of us who've had to take step exams and things, you know, they t love to throw out examples of, you know, familial syndromes and you know your sickle cell patient he has a renal mass and he's young and you know these are things that kind of lock away as far as you know medullary with with sickle cell and you know translocation tumor that's one that's relatively new that you may not have heard of before but these are younger patients with sporadic renal cell but they tend to have diffuse metastatic disease when they come in so this is something you know you have a 30 or 40 year old patient who comes in and they're just have cancer all over the place despite maybe even a small renal mass uh, <clears throat> the reason this comes about is because of a mutation in VHL, so uh, von Hippel-Lindau gene, which is associated with the syndrome, is also most commonly mutated in everybody who has sporadic renal cell carcinoma. Uh, that's also about 80-85% of the time that it's due to a mutation in this gene. So what happens? Uh, VHL is a protein that targets a particular thing for degradation. That thing is a protein called hypoxia inducible factor and the name belies what happens. So this is a protein that's made whenever the cell is hypoxic. So it's telling the cell that it's not getting enough blood. If VHL is not around, that particular substance doesn't go away and so you get a large amount of this hypoxia factor and so your kidney cells start saying make blood vessels and they start sending out a whole bunch of things that tell the body to grow blood vessels. That's why this is an angiogenic cancer, that's why these things bleed. Kind of all goes back to that story of, of how these things develop and it all comes about because of this hypoxia gene. And just as an aside, we'll get to this, but this understanding of VHL and HIF is how we have come to really understand how to treat kidney cancer today. So, what about stage at presentation? So most of the time this is going to be localized. That's about two-thirds of the time. A third of the time they're either going to have regional disease, which is nodal disease, or distant metastatic disease. Uh, if you also look at most studies, so a third of patients present with metastatic disease, a third of patients develop metastatic disease after treatment, and a third of patients are cured uh, you know, no matter how you manage them. In terms of survival, if they are truly localized, 90% of the time they're going to survive uh, their disease, but then the numbers start to drop off quite dramatically uh, with relatively dismal survival in people who have any evidence of metastatic disease. The options for management, uh, currently in the present era of renal cell carcinoma, there are really about six ways that you can approach these things. You can do active surveillance, you can do a biopsy, you can do ablation, take it out, take out the whole thing, or you can do systemic therapy. Active surveillance, which is really kind of the new thing or new thinking about renal cell carcinoma, um, is what I'll spend most of the time talking about as far as management. And it's recommended as an initial option for masses that are less than three centimeters in size. And so it involves actual imaging on some set time frame to watch for a growth pattern. The way to think about this is, is that when somebody comes in with a renal mass, 
It's a snapshot in time. So it's just imagine a Polaroid picture of the mass. I don't know what it looked like three months ago. I don't know what it's going to look like three months from now. So I have no idea what trajectory it's on. And as I showed you earlier, most patients who have localized disease are cured. So if you turn the question on its head, if most patients are cured, do most patients need to actually be treated? And so the indications to treat are if these masses grow big, so more than three centimeters in size, or if they are documenting a growth rate that would suggest it's actually cancer. So what about this? This comes from Johns Hopkins where they actually are following people with renal cell carcinoma. And what we find when we actually watch small renal masses and don't do anything about it, even though I know that 80% of these are cancer, is that only 60% are actually going to grow, 40% are either not going to grow or they're actually going to shrink, and of the ones that actually grow, only 20% are going to grow at some rate where you need to intervene. So most small masses actually don't require any treatment. What about safety? So again, you've mentioned the word cancer, somebody stops listening, they say, I have cancer, this needs to come out. How safe can it be that you're telling me now I have cancer and you're not going to do anything about it? And the reality is, is it is extremely safe. So the risk of metastatic disease is associated with size, just like the risk of having a malignancy is associated with size. For masses less than three centimeters, the chance of presenting with metastatic disease is less than 1%. So it's almost unheard of. Now, I'm saying that's at presentation. What about with follow-up? Um, also, the risk of developing metastatic disease when you're following these patients is only about 1.2% if it, you just kind of take everybody at less than three centimeters. So this is a very safe approach for watching things. They're not likely going to develop metastatic disease in six months. Uh, the reality is, and the reason that, that I like this, is that, again, not all patients need treatment. If somebody with a small renal mass comes back with metastatic disease in six months, they had metastatic disease at presentation, and I wasn't going to cure them by cutting out their mass in the first place. This isn't something that just develops overnight. This is something that grows over time. The pros of this, again, it's safe, provides more data, so I'm getting some longitudinal follow-up. I'm getting a trajectory watching this, um, and then not all patients need intervention, so I'm getting it to avoid intervening on patients when I don't need to. The cons are that it requires a reliable patient, and it requires that idea that I'm going to accept some risk. Again, the I have cancer, and I'm not going to do anything about it. Biopsy, so this is something that's done by radiology. It's gotten quite good. It used to be, if you pulled up a textbook probably 10 years ago, it would say absolutely do not biopsy kidney masses because there was this rare but known association of needle tract seeding. And it's because the way we used to biopsy real masses, we take a needle, we shove it through the back, take a biopsy, pull it out, send it to the lab. Now what we do is we put in a sheath and then we put a needle through the sheath, take a biopsy, take the needle out, take the sheath out, so we've never actually touched any tissue other than the kidney with the needle that's taking the biopsy. So the risk of needle tract seeding is almost zero. The problem with biopsy is about 15% of the time what you get back is something that's not diagnostic. So not normal kidney, not cancer, but just tissue. We don't know what it is. Can't really give you much else to go on other than we have tissue. And so it doesn't help in the discussion. So what I would say is, is that a lot of people like biopsies in the idea of I get to know what I have before I make a decision. But if you have, say, a young patient, are you going to accept a 15% rate of non-diagnostic when there's already an 80% chance walking through the door that it's cancer and not just make a decision on the assumption that this is cancer? Probably not. So really the only role is if it's going to make some change in decision making. So these are questionably enhancing masses, patients where you know, operating on them or you know, even ablating them has a high risk. You know, people who have a really severe baseline chronic kidney disease where it's likely I'm gonna push them to dialysis if I do anything with them. Or if they have a other primary solid tumor and this doesn't look like kidney cancer. If I think this could be a met from something else, then it's a good idea to get a biopsy because taking those out isn't going to help the patient. Ablation, also done by radiology. This involves some thermal energy, either cryoablation, which is freezing, or radiofrequency, which is heating, so I either freeze it or burn it. Um, it's indicated as an option for, again, masses that are less than three centimeters, so we're talking about in that same space as observation or active surveillance. And it is extremely safe. So, you know, there's longer term data coming out regarding these ablation procedures, and with the exception of radiofrequency ablation or, or burning, if you look at cryotherapy, the 
success or you know chance that they're going to recur locally or even distantly is the same as if I went in surgically and cut it out. Uh, this has really kind of taken over the management of small renal masses and honestly with the exception of young patients where you need tissue because they could recur down the road or they could have a familial syndrome or they could have some genetic risk that needs counseling. Uh, percutaneous ablation has become something that I offer most people with very small masses who don't feel comfortable observing it. These patients go home the next day. It can often be done as an outpatient. They recover quickly. They're back to work in a couple of days. Whereas when I operate on somebody, even if I do it robotically, you know, they're out of work for two to three weeks and there is an impact with that. Partial nephrectomy, so this is the me operating scenario. Um, so this is removing the mass off the kidney. It can be done in a lot of different ways. We can do it open with a big incision on their side or through their front. We can do it robotically, just a couple of poke holes. But the real goal here is let's just remove the mass, preserve as much tissue as possible so they have functional kidney um, and keep them off of, say, dialysis or having to go on you know, renal diets, change the medications, what have you. The indication here are small masses, so again, that same space of, of masses that are, um, you know, in this case, less than four centimeters is the distinction for a T1A, so four centimeters. Uh, patients with complex cystic masses, and that's because, as I've told you already, cystic renal cell carcinoma is very benign. So you could have a 10 centimeter cystic mass and very easily just partial it off the kidney because these things don't like to recur, they don't like to spread. Um, if they have pre-existing chronic kidney disease, this is a role to just do a partial nephrectomy or if they have familial syndromes where they're gonna recur locally. So patients with VHL routinely will get multiple partial nephrectomies over their lifespan because they constantly recur within the kidney with new masses. Uh, and so this is another role for just removing the mass and why, you know, when you see somebody who you think has a familial syndrome, it's important to get them referred relatively early to somebody for follow-up. Radical nephrectomy, on the other hand, this is removing the whole entire kidney. So now we're getting out of the realm of preservation of renal function. So it's indicated for larger masses where really the likelihood of removing the mass and leaving functional tissue behind is almost nil. Masses that, again, are too complex to perform a partial on, or masses with a tumor thrombi. So those are, are really the indications to remove the entire kidney. And this can be done open, it can be done laparoscopically, it can be done robotically, it can be done about a thousand ways. It just really depends on the comfort level with the mass, the comfort level with the patient, what all needs to happen. Back around to systemic therapy. So you know, kidney cancer is unique in a lot of ways in that there are more systemic therapy options for kidney cancer than for most other cancers. So when you think about systemic therapy for most cancers, people think about chemotherapy. And the common question I get asked whenever I see a patient in clinic is they say, well, am I going to need chemotherapy? Chemotherapy doesn't really work on kidney cancer. And the reason is, is that the kidney is a filter. So the kidney's role in life is filtering out toxins. Chemotherapy is a toxin in its most extreme sense. So the kidney is kind of already set up to be chemo resistant and now I'm making cancer out of a tissue that is chemo resistant. So one of the things about kidney cancer that's very unique is that we have targeted therapies which are not chemotherapy and we have immunotherapies which you know are all over the news now for treating kidney cancer. The targeted therapies really came about because we have this understanding of the role of hypoxia and hypoxia inducible factor and angiogenesis in kidney cancer. So in terms of that, there are a ton of agents that target things involved in angiogenesis. And the important thing to know about this is that these things are all either receptors or mediators, so like VEGF or, or angiogenic factors, and they work on the blood vessels, okay? They don't work on the kidney cancer, they don't work on the kidney cancer cells, except in very rare instances. And so these are not cytotoxic. So chemotherapy is cytotoxic, it kills cells. Targeted therapy doesn't kill cells. There are very rare reports of people who have durable responsive to, responses to targeted therapy or cures to targeted therapy, but you do not cure people with targeted therapy and kidney cancer. You turn kidney cancer into a chronic disease. So people live with this suppression of their kidney cancer cells and hopefully for a long period of time before they begin to progress. On the flip side of this panel is immunotherapy. So 
I hope um, and I trust most of y'all have probably seen Nivolumab all over the news. It's called Opdivo. They had these great commercial campaigns in the past year. And it's an immunotherapy that's really been approved for a ton of solid tumors, initially for lung cancer and for melanoma. And it's all aimed after targeting this thing called PD-1, which is called programmed death uh, receptor one. And so what happens is you use these antibodies, they're either against the ligand, which is the thing that binds the receptor, or against the receptor, to help tell your immune system not to shut off. So cancer cells have this really nice thing in the fact that they come from you, so they look like you, other than the fact that their genetics are different. And so when your immune cells see cancer cells, they think, ah, this is me. And so even though the cell itself looks funny on the outside, the immune cells get told, hey, this is Dr. Parker, so let's not kill it. And so the immune cells get turned off. And so what happens is, is that if you have immune cells that would have normally responded to the weird funny things that are coming off the cancer, it won't anymore because they get told, this is me, let's not kill it. So these new drugs, these, you know, Opdivo or Nivolumab, um, there are a ton of other ones, pembrolizumab, adalizumab, they all have you know, terribly complex long names. Um, they all are aimed at shutting off that signal so that the cancer can get attacked by your immune system. Just as a way of historical reference, if you're interested in this particular pathway, this was actually first characterized in kidney cancer. So it actually came from kidney cancer cells where they first identified what is now known as PDL1, but used to be known as something called B7H1. Just as an aside for why these medications work for kidney cancer. But this has been going on for a long time. So we've treated kidney cancer with immunotherapy for decades. It used to be interferon alpha, and then it was something called high dose IL-2. And these agents, so immunotherapies actually do have some cytotoxic potential. So you can cure people with immunotherapies, and this has really changed how we manage kidney cancer, particularly in the metastatic setting. And with that, I'll conclude by saying that incidental real masses are common. Um, if they're solid and enhancing, it's probably a kidney cancer. If it's cystic, the most important thing to do is get some sense of it by the Bosniak classification. So, you know, I, I call up my radiologist all the time and say, what, pin it down, what do you think this is? What Bosniak cyst classification this is? Um, because a lot of them don't need follow up. And then the other thing to know is that the landscape is changing. And I would say it's changing on both ends of the disease. So you have a shift with low stage disease going towards let's do nothing and watch this and get more, ima you know, more imaging, more data points, let's see where it's going. And on the other end with advanced disease, we've gotten more aggressive with other agents and how we can treat it and cure it. Whereas we used to not have many cures and why the, you know, the survival for distant metastatic disease is 12%. So. Thanks. I'll take questions. Um, how long do you suggest, or what do you do at the trial of a small tumor? How frequently would you uh, recommend a CT scan, or how long, how far out from the initial surgery? <laughs> so the question is, how long do you follow people who've you know been treated with cryoablation? or some form of percutaneous ablation. Uh, you know, my own practice is, is I get a scan at three months, and the goal there is, is that there is a known rate of something called technical failure. So you stick a needle in it, you freeze it, but maybe you didn't get the whole thing. And so that first three month scan is really important in order to look to see is there any residual enhancement in the area where they ablated the lesion. And so that is gonna be a marker of technical failure. From there, as long as I don't see that, then I tend to follow them on a yearly basis. The question is how long do you follow them? That's much harder to answer as you probably all know who've looked at any guideline statement that exists. Everybody's great about giving guidelines for the first three to five years and then every guideline panel gets very vague about how long do you continue doing it. The reality is, is kidney cancer is, is unique in that it has a very common propensity common in the sense that it happens, common propensity to have very late recurrences. So kidney cancer can kind of smolder for a long time. So I would say I follow people yearly five to 10 years and then you know, we have a conversation of when do we start spacing the follow-up out? You know, it's other comorbidities, are they starting to become you know, less healthy where I think it's probably not gonna matter if this recurs. 
Um, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah. So what's the rate or what do you see the percentage of So recurrence with sporadic kidney cancers have been treated. So you know, if you look at most studies that look at small renal masses, so T1A renal masses, the risk of recurrence is you know around one to two percent if it's been completely treated. That said, the problem is is when do they recur? You know, most will recur quite early within the first two to three years, but then there are people who continue to recur 15, 20 years down the road. How many in your practice are bilateral? Let's say somebody you remove one kidney. How much are you worried about the remaining kidney? So, you know, the, the only cell type that has a strong propensity to recur in the other kidney is papillary. So papillary renal cell carcinoma has this known association with multifocal and bilateral tumors. Even with that, the risk is quite low. You know, we're talking around 5 to 10% at most. Um, it's quite rare that I see people who present bilateral or who then subsequently develop bilateral tumors. Yes? Do you think any renal ultrasounds versus CT scans after your initial evaluation for follow-up and inherent risk for rate of dying radiation? For people on follow-up, so guys on or people on active surveillance, you know, honestly, I, I don't. Uh, and the reason is is that the inner observer variability for ultrasound can be quite high. So depending on the day and the ultrasound tech, where they get the largest transverse cut can vary. And since we're talking about growth rates of half a centimeter a year, I really want to know, is it changing in size? So I want a thin slice CT that goes through it. You know, when you look at data, the you know, I did my fellowship at Mayo and they looked at their own data about you know, CT protocols in terms of the amount of dose that people are actually receiving and the actual rate of contrast-induced nephropathy as long as you're watching for it, it's pretty low. Um, and so I would say that the, you know, when you look at the risk-benefit here and you're talking to a patient, the safety factor of having a close eye on the, the kidney cancer far exceeds the potential risk of, you know, a yearly low-dose CT scan to the kidney. So prior to total resection, is there any evaluation of the ipsilateral kidney function? So no, not typically. So I would say unless somebody has really poor baseline renal function, I'm not looking to go in and do a heroic partial. So there's really good data about the overall survival and you know, other associated risks when you take out a kidney. And the reality is, is that for the most part, kidney masses declare themselves. Either you have to take out the whole thing or you don't. And so it's kind of a, let's see where the pieces fall after we take it out. Absolutely. So I, you know, in my practice, when I have somebody who's less than 50 who comes in with a kidney mass, I recommend or talk with them about genetic referral. You know, I have them actually meet with a geneticist to go over their family tree and look. Um, you know, the problem with genetic testing, it's pretty easy to order genetic testing, say I want to order X genetic panel. The problem is, is that the downstream consequence of finding something can be quite severe. So, you know, you can disbar somebody from getting life insurance or disability insurance or, you know, who knows what other than health insurance, at least for now, uh, just based on their genetic testing. So I encourage people to go get genetic counseling and see if they want to know. Uh, because I do think it's important for people who have kids, if there's any chance this is genetic syndrome, they do need to be watched um, pretty closely. The nice thing is for you know, VHL, Berthog Dubé families, they know that they have that. Those are pretty strong family histories. Um, you know, it's pretty rare to find a sporad, you know, just somebody walk in and not know that they have a genetic syndrome, at least in that vein.
כן. 